It's an oligopoly at, at best, and in places it's probably a cartel. Should we limit or end inheritance? Because, I mean, one of the biggest divides now is between those young people whose parents own a house and can help them own a house and those who don't have the bank of mum and dad. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the right way of looking at the, at the issue. Like, in, a, in the same way that I'm not sure that questions like, do we have too much home ownership, are the right way of looking at the issue. You know, the level of home ownership, which hasn't changed, you know, isn't the problem. It's the way we approach the whole of the structure of the housing market. So inheritance, you know, is just, it's one element and it isn't the problem. You know, the problem is the way we approach the financialization of every aspect of land and property and housing. And to, to come back to the earlier point about why are France and Germany different, I would say France and Germany are different because we have followed these very financialized policies since the 1980s, just like the US has. And this is essentially a sort of Reaganomics policy. And European housing has been very different. It's been much more mixed. It hasn't had this continuous obsession with home ownership. Um, you know, they have a really strong co-op housing sector, they have a really strong rented housing sector, and they have home ownership. We've just been obsessed with home ownership and we haven't even got any more. And just to pick up on the housing benefit point, I mean, we have also imported similar policies that the US have, they call it, they have vouchers, where instead of building social homes, people are subsidized to live in really poor condition uh, accommodation in the private sector. So it's not about, oh, you know, is home ownership the problem or is inheritance the problem? These sound like kind of political things we can get around, you know, inheritance is bad, you know, home ownership is bad. No, it's the way we approach the whole system, I, I would say. Yeah, Kristen. Uh, so I want to jump in about two things. The first thing is it's absolutely true that I think the US voucher system is a disaster. And we also have really good examples of when the US government built housing, and it's primarily military housing. I've lived in several cities where the military comes in and builds entire neighborhoods. They're lovely homes. They're not substandard. And they're just owned by the government. And then they're um, sort of leased out to members of the military. So we know how to do it. And we do it as long as you're willing to go overseas and kill people for us, you get a house. Um, I think we should take that benefit and, 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 and the knowledge that we have in providing military housing and just expand it radically, because I agree that there's a shortage of homes. Um, and that the Germans are very good about building. They, they have a much more progressive way about building, but also of renting. But on the question of inheritance, I mean, I think that there are very good arguments for the abolition of inheritance. I'm not gonna rehearse those here because I think that's enough of a kind of unconventional view that I'll just leave it. But no, I- No, let's be unconventional. Well, we're we're right. how the light gets in. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> but, I, but I wanna just plug something. So, so yes, there is a very good argument to be made for why the intergenerational transfer of wealth and property actually hinders our societies rather than helps them. But I am really interested in the work of Thomas Piketty, the French economist, who argues that we should have a universal basic inheritance so that every young citizen of a state, when they turn 25, should get 150,000 euro, that's his proposal, in order to help them get on the property ladder, in order to actually help them launch. And that that would go a long way in undoing the inequality that comes from intergenerational wealth and privilege. I, I, uh, I wasn't familiar with uh, that particular idea that he had, but I, I will check it out. My concern with that, um, all other things being equal, is, is it injects a huge amount of demand into a market uh, without necessarily increasing the supply of housing. So or I would kind of... Just house prices. I would, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that, that would be my concern. Well, so I would kind of tur yeah. turn it around and say, well, actually, shouldn't we... And in, in, on the subject of in, inheritance tax, uh, I, I, I mean... Uh, I think it's not about whether it should exist or not. I mean, I personally think it should exist. I think it's about where you set it. Uh, and I think also making sure that we, we, we stop the wealthy doing what they, they do, which is they tend to avoid it completely, if not entirely, because they find ways, find ways around it to close those loopholes. 
But let's, you know, let's look at wealth as a whole and, um, uh, uh, and you know, take, take some of that wealth and put it into building rather than into subsidizing, you know, demand, I would say. So for, for me, it comes down to bricks. But, but uh, you're the deputy mayor than, of housing. Yeah. Why do we build so few houses? You know, every government yep. says we're going to be building 300,000 a year or whatever, and they just don't. So what's going wrong? So I think that you know, we, with the levers that we've got at City Hall uh, and the primary lever that we have is the affordable homes funding that we, that we deliver. And that comes from the government, of course. The pot is set by the government, but it's, it's, it's we that sort of to an extent decide how it's um, divided up, uh, et cetera. So, you know, we've started record numbers of affordable homes um, through that uh, programme. Unfortunately, the, the funding we've got for our next programme is smaller than the funding we had from the previous programme. The government is abolishing national housing targets, which makes it harder uh, to, 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 you know, it, it makes it easier for, easier, I should say, for councils that don't want to approve uh, new housing uh, not to approve uh, uh, new uh, housing. So I think, you know, there are some fundamental structural issues here. But for me, the key thing is getting that funding in to delivering particularly new social rented housing, because with the best will in the world, you can't deliver social housing without some form of public subsidy. It's just impossible. One form of public subsidy would be um, a radical proposition in my book is that the state makes better use of its land. The state owns 6% of all freehold land yeah, in the, in the UK, 15% in urban areas, many prime sites. The reason council houses are so hard to build, and by the way, Blair and Brown be, built f fewer council houses in the entire New Labour era than Margaret Thatcher did every single year. It's true. That's just a historic it's, it's true. Rea it's, reality. It's, it's okay. true. It's, it's, why? It's true. Why? Be be because... But it, many, many complicated reasons, but basically because the Treasury at the time has this view and still does to this day that if you build more homes and the house prices level or come down, then there'll be a banking crash because 70%... I mean... Se let me just finish the point. Because 70... Please. 70% 70 of loans are linked to residential property in this country. So there's a kind of inbuilt bias and Treasury civil servants, it, it allies with their inner NIMBY that we shouldn't build many homes. And that's true. And they say that to every housing minister that we have. And we've had 24 housing ministers in the last 22 years. Sorry, Anna. No, I mean, that figure is true. But I mean, to be fair, housing associations were supposed to be picking up the slack. And the whole idea was councils would no longer build homes and housing associations would, be, would build homes. So New Labour did build equivalent numbers of social of, of housing association homes, but it, it, it was a drop in the ocean compared to what was needed. I mean, just a, a quick point on building homes in London. We are, we have built, you know, tens of thousands of homes in London in terms of these new um, luxury apartment developments uh, everywhere. We've got, you know, 3,000 empty apartments. We've got like a you know, construction has been halted on tens of thousands. I, 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 I agree with Tom, he can't do much about this. You know, he can't build the social homes um, that we need to, to build because the subsidy isn't there. But the issue is that the government said, these are your housing numbers. And they didn't say, oh, they should be affordable or they should be social. They just said, you know, build X number. So, and you know, you just go around London, you see all the cranes, the homes are being built but they are the wrong homes. They're these foreign investor, you know, luxury homes that are completely unaffordable. The best subsidy for social housing is the state giving its land because mm. land is now 70% on average of the value of every house we build. In the 1950s, it was 5% because there's so much speculation in the system because the, the big developers practice contrived scarcity, what I call contrived scarcity. They deliberately restrict the number of homes coming to the market, they drip feed to local markets to keep prices high and margins high and profits higher building a smaller number of homes. You may think that sounds like a conspiracy theory, but the Competition and Markets Authority is now investigating exactly that issue, which I, I raised in my book, which others have raised, which successive housing secretaries have now taken really seriously, finally. It's a, a lot of restrictive practices going on in our house building industry. It's an oligopoly at, at best. And in places, it's probably a cartel. And the Secretary of State used those words, exactly those words, after taking very serious legal advice from government lawyers. Okay, come in on a couple of points. Um, I completely, I, I, Anna's abs absolutely right. There was, this, there was this shift away from councils to housing associations. And actually, um, 
what we've seen uh, over the last few years is councils really getting back into the business of delivering, not at the scale that they used to, but certainly are, are very, very bigger, a much bigger scale than they were, you know, say uh, 15 or 20 uh, years ago. And there's been deliberate city hall policies that are directed funding uh, at councils. And we need that because, you know, housing associations, particularly the big ones now, simply don't have the capacity that they once had um, to deliver. They're grappling with things like the building safety crisis, with retrofit, with also, um, and just keeping their existing stock uh, in a decent state. And they're only doing 30,000 a year, uh, right? Uh, exactly. It used to be so 80, 90, 100,000 a year when it, population it, growth was a lot slower. Exactly, exactly. When <laughs> London's population was falling and, as it was until the early 90s. Uh, but on, the, on public land, um, this is something that is absolutely crucial. There were some absolute scandals, and I think the, the Public Accounts Committee investigated this, where land was just sold off with no conditions. Um, and, you know, five years later, well, what's happened to it? Nothing's been built or very little has been built. So what we do, uh, we have something called the London Estates Delivery Unit, which works with the NHS. So we work with the NHS to get their sites. They, they, they will uh, dispose of about half of, you know, a portion of the site for housing. We put strict, you know, affordable, affordable housing requirements on it. Uh, they use the receipt then to invest in uh, better facilities on the remainder of the site. And we're, and we're working through various sites. The, the prime example being St. Anne's Hospital in Haringey, which um, had a planning permission to be built out with just 14% affordable housing, one four. It's now been built out with 60% uh, affordable housing. So, uh, you know, I'd like to see a model like that, not just with the NHS, but with all sorts of other public landowners um, in London. Can I just jump yeah. on? I just want to come back to the inheritance thing because I just saw the statistic that in the United States and in the UK, 60% of wealth is inherited, right? And to, to, to pick up on something that Liam said, I think that the, we have to understand that a lot of that inherited wealth is invested in property, right? And so there's a way in which this, is, this system is going to perpetuate itself. The, 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 the ways in which we've commodified housing and the way that that is then linked to the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. Like if we built more houses, then as you said, like the prices of those houses would go down, like the demand side would be met. And so the skyrocketing speculation, the profits that are being generated in this industry would be limited. So we have to target this fundamental problem, right? Which is that housing, is a center of profit. And it, it, the profits that are generated in the housing sector are also part of those inheritances. You've got to right? be really careful about overkill here, though. So I wrote my book because I grew up in a first generation home ownership home. So my dad grew up in a stone hut in the west of Ireland. My mum grew up in a council house with 10 kids. The fact that those working class people were able to buy their own home on, you know, one a secretary, the other a labourer, absolutely revolutionized their view of themselves, of Britain, of the fairness of society. And the, the system we have in the UK where there's no uh, tax on the capital gains on your principal residence, let me tell you, that's pretty much the only way that the vast majority of the population are ever going to create any capital in their lives, any freedom, any relief from the wolf at the door every month, any way of escaping rapacious landlords who always find a way to get round the law. So this home ownership for me is really, really important, but so is social housing. And I ended up writing just as much about social housing as I did about home ownership. And the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that the housing market in this country, for people of my parents' generation, it was a source of social mobility and progress, okay? Now, because the locked door of unaffordability faces so many, it's a source, not of social mobility, but of social immobility and of rancor and of potentially of political extremism. So I really believe in home ownership and, and Anna's right, it's currently around 60% in the UK and it's roughly what it was back in the 60s. But in the meantime, it was up above 70% in the 90s and the 2000s. And if you look at the, the global, the, the, the macro number for home ownership, you've got to break it down by age because among plus 55s, it's really high. It's up about 80%. But as I said before, between for 25 and 34 year olds, home ownership is now less than 40% compared to well over 60% when I bought my first home. And that's why we have a demographic crisis because a very high proportion of women now 28, the average age for first children, now live in rented accommodation. 
just 10% did in the early 90s. Now it's almost 50%. And that's why people aren't having kids, because they want the security of home ownership before they have kids. So let's not diss home ownership, and let's not diss in a sense of radicalism. I like being radical, but if you take away that tax-free capital gain for ordinary people for the one home that they own, that their families have worked generations, believe me, to get their name on that title deed after generations, thousands of years of, of, of serfdom, basically, you take that away from them, you're gonna have a much, much more radical society. Yeah, just to be clear, oh. sorry, just oh, sorry. to be clear, I wasn't suggesting that primary residences should not be private. Sure. I'm saying that rental property is the sure. problem, right? So, so, so how many? One? Can you even have one? In, even in communist Can you have one rental area? property? Uh, I don't think so. You seen what's happened to the stock market in the last yeah. 20 years? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I that Everyone that has to make losses? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just think that there's a way that, there, that, that everybody needs a home. And as long as um, people see home housing as a profit center, right, that that creates a, 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 a massive inequality in society that just then further grows as those properties get handed down over the generations. But even in like a purely communist country like Bulgaria, prior to 89, people were allowed to own their own homes privately, right? Because it was understood exactly what you're saying, that for some people, that security and stability is really important. And I mentioned in my opening remarks that absolutely the demographic crisis is related to this. So the fact that people aren't having children, the fact that people don't feel secure enough to start families is directly related to the housing crisis. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.